Welcome to this week's Humanities Forum. My name is Raymond Hain. I'm a member of the philosophy department here and the director of the forum. This week is a very special guest that we have with us this afternoon. A part of the purpose of the forum is to integrate certain events with the DWC program. And today's program helps us do that in a very special way with respect to music and the expression of themes in the Middle Ages through music. To introduce our guest this afternoon, please join me uh, in welcoming Father Vincent Farabagan, who's a member of the theology department and the music departments here at PC. So today we welcome Father Garrick Huang. He is originally from Vancouver, British Columbia. And there, where he grew up, he earned a bachelor degree in music with a specialization in opera performance, and then worked for two years as a classical singer before going to the seminary. He started seminary in 2003 in Denton, Nebraska, that is seminary with the priestly fraternity of St. Peter, which is dedicated, uh, which was founded in 1988, uh, and specifically does the older form of the liturgy for those faithful who, who desire that. And Gregorian chant is especially connected to what they do and to their education. And so, um, so it makes sense that uh, they've, they've got quite, uh, they're uh, quite a skilled group of chant singers in the priestly fraternity. So he was, uh, for those seven years as a seminarian, as often happens if you have a background in music, he was enlisted to do teaching of music. So he taught chant to other um, seminarians, to priests, to women religious, um, during that time with his musical background um, and has been singing chant regularly since then, since age 21. He was ordained a priest in Lincoln, Nebraska in May 2010 and since then has served as an assistant parish priest um, and a chaplain as well. Uh, so he sung the chant of the mass and chant of the divine office, the regular liturgy of the hours that is prayed by priests and religious. Uh, so he's sung Gregorian chant in all of its various forms in Canada in the US, in Mexico, France, and Germany. And last year, the fraternity re released a CD called Requiem. So the Requiem chants are chants that are sung for the mass for the dead, sung for funeral masses, and uh, they would sing these chants regularly, and the idea came to, to record them and let others listen to them. So the CD is mostly chant. Uh, it also has some polyphony from Palestrina and from Martini, a, a less well-known composer, but a teacher of Mozart. Um, and so this CD just came out last year, I think in May, was May. it maybe? May of, of 2017. So, and it sold several thousand copies. So you can look it up, it's called Requiem. Um, and so that was number one on the Billboard Classical Charts for four weeks. And so today, Father Garrick <coughs> will be speaking about chant as you can see here. Um, and unfortunately I have, did not bring up the title of your talk, but it is? As the heart uh, longs for running waters. So welcome with me, Father Garrick Huang. Thank you very much, Father. All right. Have a good performance now. I have a lapel microphone right here, so I'll just use that. So how many of you have ever sung Gregorian chant before? A few of you? Very good, very good. My first experience with Gregorian chant was uh, first year music history class. I remember listening to it perhaps during the lecture <laughs> definitely in the listening room with a few of my colleagues. And um, after five minutes, we went to the next uh, genre of music, which was probably like Ars Nouveau or anything, uh, Ars Nova, I'm sorry, and anything else in the medieval time period. So I never really was drawn to Gregorian chant, but then one day my best friend in the music program says, let's go off to Latin mass. And uh, again, I had never experienced that before. And so my first listening to Guerrero and chant live was when I went to Mass. My experience of attending a Catholic liturgy probably is very similar to yours. A lot of contemporary music, a lot of contemporary instruments, especially the piano, uh, amplified singing, a lot of hymns, and a lot of probably glory and praise type of music. And what struck me as I was going through this opera program and having studied classical music since the age of 10, was that this music was pleasant, but it wasn't anything to stand the test of time. I knew that there was always something lacking. And also, I noticed that the people were participating in a certain way with this type of music, but ultimately, the person who 
had the microphone was the, control, was the one in control of the entire music program. Anyway, so when I discovered Gregorian chant, it was the exact opposite. Actually, it mirrored what I had been studying and what I had experienced in classical music. No microphones. The music was of a certain quality that you could recognize that it, it's going to stand the test of time, and it had stood the test of time. And so for me, desiring to cultivate the musical art, I thought, well, why not I try to learn some Gregorian chant. So I apprenticed with a few priests who had in themselves studied Gregorian chant for years uh, in monasteries in France and in other situations. And what I realized with Gregorian chant, another aspect, and I'll develop this more later on in my talk, was it helped me to question my identity as a singer. Because when you're in the opera, you have to be heard. Not only do you have to be heard, you have to have the attention on you. And so when I remember watching the musicians in a regular parish that I used to frequent, I noticed that they had a lot of attention on them. People knew who they were. People recognized their voices. People applauded when they had done, finished the liturgy, etc. And yet with Gregorian chant, I realized that, well, one, you're not trying to be individualistic. You're trying to actually blend your voice as much as possible in order to form a unity. And you're not trying to attack attention. And so for me, it was a certain tonic. It was a certain medicinal counterbalance to what I was trying to accomplish with my uh, young professional career. So that's just by way of introduction. And so I realized the Gregorian chant was truly a masterpiece. It was timeless, and the proof of this is we've been singing the same melodies for over a thousand years. You can't really name another genre of music other than perhaps folk music that has stood this test of time. Let me just begin with the brief history of Gregorian chant. We don't know who the authors are, who the composers are of these melodies. They're monophonic which means is, is predominantly a, a melody that you're singing. We know that some, through research, some of the melodies have a very Semitic Palestinian origin. And even though it's not verifiable, there's a certain tradition that some of these melodies even come from the liturgy of the temple in Jerusalem prior to its destruction. Furthermore, the style of singing for the psalmody, which makes up the bulk of the Gregorian repertoire definitely has a Jewish origin. But as this culture and this music went over into Europe, obviously you're having now a convergence of many cultures. The Latins in the first few centuries loved Greek culture. And so you had this certain uh, way of rationalizing what they were trying to do in, say, the Jewish cult, and now the Christian cult. And so you have generally five components of what we call Gregorian chant. You have the Jewish psalmody, as I said. You also had the practice of religious monks singing the psalms in their manner. So a second source of the Gregorian melodies is monastic choir psalmody. And you're also dealing with the ancient practice of setting religious text or even important text to music. And also you have the actual recitatives, the, the singing cantillation, um, the proclamation of prayers and readings in the Christian liturgy by the ministers, priests, deacons, lectors, etc. And then also you have the popular elements of the time. As you can see, it's very vague. Where do we get these melodies, ultimately? We don't know. And yet, after a certain time, because it was passed on through an oral tradition, somebody had just verbally, audibly ta taught it to whomever else was apprenticing with them, and they were always faithful. A lector was always supposed to know exactly how to sing this. There was never a question of deviating or trying something new. He always had to receive the tradition. And so we see this once we started actually copying down 
the notes or making some sort of mnemonic devices, writing down a musical notation, the versions are actually very similar because the people did not want to deviate once it came time to receiving this patrimony. Gregorian chant is a monument. If you walk into the ancient churches or basilicas of Europe, you're awestruck. There's something from a different time. And yet, there's a whole story behind why they built things the way they did. What was the language of the architecture? Same thing with chant. It is a monument. So when you hear Gregorian chant, you're actually brought back into a different time with a certain language and a certain style. So Rome was the center of the Roman liturgy. You also had different liturgies, different ways of celebrating the Christian ceremony in parts of Italy. In the north of Italy, you had Milan as a center, so you had Ambrosian liturgy. Rome was in the center, then you had a southern liturgy, and you had a southern style of singing. But because Rome was the center of where the, the pope was, his liturgy and his style of singing, his music, had a certain predominance. And so you have something called Old Roman Chant. And in the seventh century, you actually had a group of singers form to come together to form a certain choir, a papal choir that would celebrate the pope's liturgies. And it predominantly had 20, 20, uh, 20 singers. And so they started out with simple melodies, but they were also like having the influences of the Eastern Empire from Byzantium and Constantinople, where they developed homophony. And so sometimes you had the simple melodies now being accompanied with other notes. Let's just jump a little bit ahead. In the 11th century, 10th, 11th century, they started to write down the melodies. Not in this format or in a format that you're more familiar with. Nevertheless, they started using certain memory devices, trying to remember exactly when do we go up, when do we come down, how fast should we sing this piece? What sort of ornamentation should we give it? And then you had the invention of musical notation in the 11th century. And what happened with regard to making a musical notation is things became very clear, delimited, delimited, pardon me. And so now, instead of having this free sense of singing, you're actually having to put it into a structure. So they invented the structure in order to help you remember things, but what you ended up doing was you end up restricting the variety of sound. That's around the 11th century. Just prior to that, a few centuries before that, 8th century, Pope Stephen II had gone off to France to visit the Carolingian Frankish king, Pepin the Short, and his son, Charlemagne. Pepin the Short, king of the Franks, 8th century, mid-8th century, was very impressed with the style of singing from the papal court, and the papal liturgy. And he thought, you know, if I use this liturgy of the pope, I can now create greater unity in my realm, especially with the religious practice. So he said to the pope, I would like you to send some of your professional singers, some of your religious singers, to my court in France send some of your books. And so this Carolingian, Frankish, French influence on the Roman chant gave rise to Gregorian chant. So I'm just going to play you a few excerpts right now of what is presumably Roman chant a little bit prior to the Frankish influence in its developments. This is an Easter liturgy. This day the Lord has made, let us be glad and rejoice.
florid it is, how ornamented, how chromatic. They're always playing around with these little motions of half steps, if you're familiar with that terminology. This is what we do today. <laughs> resembles, but the style was considerably different. So after Pope Stephen II and his successor sent the liturgical traditions over to France, and you had this now, this fusion, this hybrid style starting, this Franco-Roman style, you still had in Rome the papal liturgy continuing. In 1277, Nicholas III, when he heard this fused, uh, this hybrid style, he preferred that. And so he um, arbitrarily suppressed this old Roman chant that we presumably just heard. Again, it's just conjectured. It's just uh, through uh, modern uh, research that we're trying to rebuild this type of uh, sound and this type of style of singing. So can you imagine that? So 600 there are about 600 years of musical patrimony was told to stop and even destroyed. And so this Frankish Roman style singing sounded more like this. exactly what they were singing, what part, uh, or from what manuscript they were singing, but I found some that at least resembles. Gloria in excelsis Deo, et in terra pax omnibus bone voluntatis. Okay. Again, less ornamented, but very similar. So this Gregorian chant, this Franco-Roman hybrid, became very much uh, the common music that you heard in the liturgy. Throughout the medieval period, you also had other developments in liturgical music with polyphony, different styles, two voices, three voices, and whatnot. Gregorian chant started to be seen as a secondary type of music or something not as interesting as the big concert masses that were starting to become popular. They even changed the way they wrote chant. So this is a 19th century way of writing chant. As you can see, it's not very expressive. It gives you the notes. And this way of writing chant became more popular in the 18th century also because they just thought, well, we just have to transmit the notes regardless of how you sing it. And apparently, according to some commentators, when they looked at this music, they just sang it in a very romantic style without much, different, with much difference. So I'm just going to interpret this just based on the notes without using much inflection. <laughs> So 
imagine going to an hour's worth of mass like that. It could be a bit monotonous, it could be a bit irregular. So Gregorian chant became a certain, fell into a certain decadence, you could say. In the 19th century, in the 1832, after the French Revolution, you had the refounding of the Benedictine order in France. And the Benedictines took it upon themselves to sing the divine office. The divine office is eight times a day where priests and religious monks and brothers get together to praise God in the chapel or in the chapter room. And they wanted to sing the liturgy, but they found that they didn't have any books. So the abbot at the time in 1832 and in the succeeding decades, he sent his monks around Europe to scour and to find out the manuscripts of the chant, try to bring them back together, and to reestablish this type of singing. And so the Gregorian chant that we sing today, that you commonly hear, that you might have heard on our recording in the Requiem CD, it is a 19th century endeavor to find a more pure liturgical chant that goes back a thousand years. And if you have the opportunity of getting your hands on a, a Libre Usualis as this, you will see that it's still very much used today, still being published today. And uh, it allows for a certain differentiation of musical style and helps the singer interpret what the text is supposed to say. What are the liturgical aspects of Gregorian chant? Pope Pius X in 1903, he wrote a motu proprio on liturgical music. And he determined three criteria for determining what type of music should be sung in a Catholic liturgy. And the, the abbreviation that I was taught to help me remember what are these three qualities, it's the word hug, holiness, universality, goodness and being what we mean as beauty of form. Liturgical music is supposed to be holy. It's supposed to help people pray. It's supposed to lift up one's heart in order to consider spiritual things, heavenly realities. It's supposed to help the person get out of themselves, out of their regular habits. Because the Sunday religious observance was still very important at the time. Another aspect of liturgical music is supposed to be universal. It's supposed to be applicable regardless of condition, time, or situation. And so Gregorian chant, according to Pope Pius X, said this is the music that is best suited for the Latin liturgy regardless of culture around the world. And when I had to celebrate a funeral uh, a year ago for a woman born in Africa, and a lot of her family came to the funeral, we did a, a requiem mass, and I was very edified and surprised that a lot of the people who had grown up in Africa had studied with religious sisters in a parochial situation. They knew the requiem mass by heart. The poor widower is standing at the front of the, of the pew, standing and just singing along with me without the music. It was very impressive. And so liturgical music is supposed to be universal. The third aspect is also what we call beauty of form or goodness. It's supposed to be good music. And so we are supposed to be able to look at this type of musical production and recognize it what it is. It's vocal singing that has a beginning, a development, and a conclusion. And it's also so, uh, uh, in a very systemized scientific way. Gregorian chant is divided into eight modes or eight scales, you could say where everything is in proportion. And so when you have a very specific identity of the musical style, when you're composing or when you're trying to interpret it, you're actually obliged to follow all the rules. And so it leaves out that, how would I say, that individualistic interpretation, trying to put your own nuance into things. So the, the, the music ends up protecting you in a certain way. You have to lay aside your personality in order to sing it. Another thing is, 
these melodies also serve to highlight what the text is. I'll give you a few examples. You have the psalm, out of the depths I have cried unto you, O Lord, O Lord, hear my prayer. Out of the depths I have cried unto you, O Lord, O Lord, hear my prayer. De provo, de provo. to God, a certain amount of melancholy in the, in the music, but again, the, the liturgical, the Gregorian chant is able to capture the sense. Gregorian chant is also a style of music that doesn't resemble more modern styles, more secular styles, and that's something in the church that we've always tried to held, to always tried to hold that elements of Profane culture, when I say profane, I just mean outside of the temple. Things that happen outside in, in the piazza should not find its way inside into the religious worship of the church. And so one of the things that is very typical of Gregorian chant is what we call a melisma. A melisma is where you have many notes on one syllable, which gives you time to meditate on that word. And you always have that with what we call the Alleluia, the praise of God. This is one from the Assumption of Mary. And so Mary ascended into heaven, or pardon me, Mary was assumed into heaven, and we celebrate that feast on August 15th. So this is the Alleluia for her feast day. It's a more of a modern composition, but it gives us something to just reflect on. So we're just already meditating on the following text. Mary was assumed into heaven. Assumpta es Maria in cielum. So this tonal painting of Gregorian chant became the hallmark of liturgical music. Another important aspect of Gregorian chant is its rhythm. It is a very rhythmic music but what it is not, it is not metered. And metered music is, has a strong beat and a weak beat. You know, your typical waltz, one, two, three, bum, da, da, bum, 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 bum. Or you can have a march, bum, 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 bum. Or what I like to show when I give this presentation sometimes to young people in high school, I say, well, you remember when the, uh, the orcs from the Lord of the Rings, their music, was a five rhythm, which is not found in nature. Bum, 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 okay. So Gregorian chant is a rhythm, a rhythmic music, but without meter, so you don't have strong and weak beats. What it is, it's binary and ternary. One, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. It's very intellectual. You feel it inside, but what you don't feel, you don't feel this pressure this visceral pressure to keep you going. So Gregorian chant is not sensual. Gregorian chant doesn't get you pumped. You're not going to listen to Gregorian chant before you go out to play football, soccer, or hockey. But that's specifically done for a reason, because if it's more intellectual, it's more, in that sense, spiritual, it helps contribute to this process of detaching us from our weekly preoccupations, and so when we go to, to a religious cult on Sunday, we're able to now disassociate our experience and listen to what's going on in the liturgy. And if you notice, if, how many of you have already been to a Latin liturgy? Okay. One thing that you realize when you go to this liturgy, if you ever have the chance, is everybody's doing something differently. There's not necessarily a complete unity. 
because, well, there is a unity, but it's in a different sense. Not everybody's at the same point at the same time. Father is in the sanctuary doing his thing. The faithful are assisting and praying in their manner at the liturgy. And the choir is singing on behalf of the participants with the official text. But they're at a different space. And so what you end up doing and what you end up experiencing is this blending together of peoples in their roles. It's very clear as to who's doing what. And the person is able to participate just as much as they want and then just go into their own reflection. And so that's what I appreciated with the Gregorian chant. When you're serving the liturgy, and it really is a service, you realize that you're constantly focused on what you're doing and what's going to come next. But at the same time, you're creating this overall sentiment of prayer that allows everybody else who might not perhaps have the opportunity to sing in the same way or with the same techniques and everything to participate in this sung spiritual liturgy. Gregorian chant is also geared towards the human voice. It's proportioned to be sung in a space, hopefully with a certain natural amplification, but without any technology. I've had to sing Gregorian chant once with a microphone when I was in the cathedral in Mexico City. And at first, I said, I don't need it because I have a pretty loud voice and I think I can do without, and I'm not comfortable singing with a microphone until I realized that the space was just so enormous that they, were not they couldn't hear anything that we were singing. So eventually we did put a microphone. But again, Gregorian chant, the way it was designed, it was meant to be sung by those who not necessarily are these extraordinary singers. If you ever hear Eastern liturgical chant, especially the Armenian chant or the Byzantine chant, you better be a good singer. From what I've been told, what I was told traditionally, if you could not sing, you could not be ordained. That's not the case in the Latin church. Perhaps unfortunately, nevertheless. <laughs> but, but, ne but what I'm saying is the Gregorian chant was very much designed for a limited range proportioned to the human capability. And so not the two extremes. Gregorian chant, I've been doing it for around almost 20 years. When I started doing it, it was very much an intellectual exercise. It was very new. And because I was coming from it, coming, approaching Gregorian chant from a musical and a vocal production, I was always making sure, how do I sound? Are they able to hear me? Am I doing it correctly? After a few years of that, I realized, well, I don't care if I'm doing it correctly. As you saw today, I made a few mistakes. Because what you're doing is you're praying. And if you pray, you're not doing it wrong, OK? But if you're singing it, well, it might come out in different ways. So I always insist that when you actually produce the sound of Gregorian chant, you better be praying it. And so when we recorded the CD last year, that was quite well received in, in the, uh, how would you say, in the when it was being merchandised. And they were saying, so uh, what differentiates your musical project from the other musical projects? You know, what's the difference between your choir and this other choir? And I said, just instinctively, it's like, well, we're praying the music. I said, what? What are, you, what are you talking about? You're praying the music. Well, during the recording, even though we have these microphones everywhere around us, we formed up our circle. We sing in a circle so that the sound is put in the center and that we can actually build off the sound. Instead of listening in a, in a choir setting where we're actually singing to the audience, we're not singing to the audience. We create a circle, and we let the sound go from here straight up and then fill out into the space of the church, and we were praying it. I found a little quote in one of the books I was reading to prepare for this talk from the French uh, writer. Simone Weil. It is quite conceivable that someone who is passionate, who is a passionate music lover, might at the same time be evil or corrupt as a person. But I would find it hard to believe that such a thing could be true of anyone 
who has a thirst for a Gregorian chant. If you study the medieval theologians, they like to focus that simplicity is one of the attributes of God. And that the greater a creature is simple, the more it reflects God in its spiritual being. Whereas in material being, the more something is complicated and multiple, the more it is higher, the more it is greater. Well, Gregorian chant is extremely simple music. And because it's simple, it actually invites people to conform themselves to that. So you have to simplify your thoughts, simplify the way you sing, and simplify what you're trying to accomplish. And so that oneness, that unity that comes about through the music and with all the participants in there, creates something very special. And personally, because when I used to be in the opera, we were always trying to find that, that perfect sound, that perfect performance and everything. But it was always done with a certain complexity well, you don't have that in Gregorian chant. It's the reverse. The best is always when you have that one voice. One voice singing. Una voce dicentes, una voce, una voce cantantes. Singing with one voice. And so, that spiritual aid of Gregorian chant, something very particular to the Roman liturgy, as you know, as most of you said, some of you put up your hand and said that you've actually experienced live Gregorian chant before. Well, hopefully now you've all experienced it because I gave you a little sample of it. Uh, it's not the same because we're not in the right environment. We're not in the right acoustic exactly, and I'm by myself. Solo singing was to be avoided in the Latin liturgy. Um, but I do encourage you to go look for it because it gives you something as I said, it's a monument. It's, a, it's actually an artistic, cultural, historical monument. And it actually places, you some, it places yourself in a context that you share with other people in different cultures. Even though you might not speak the same language, you're able to communicate with this universal language of music. Furthermore, I would argue that the majority of music that we do here in a normal Catholic situation for a Sunday liturgy doesn't qualify as liturgical music. It is religious music, I'll grant it. The, the words speak of God. It is done during the, the, the ceremony and whatnot. But it doesn't have that notion of holiness to lift one's heart in the same way. In the same way. It increases piety. People are more engaged to perform it. But when it comes time to considering contemplative prayer, considering other aspects that bring the person out of their own uh, situation, I would argue that you don't have that in the regular situations. Furthermore, this music will not stand the test of time. 20 years from now, when you're as old as I am, and you're looking at people your age, they're going to be doing a different type of religious worship music on Sunday. I have no idea what that's going to look like. And so this constant changing this fluctuation, it makes a certain rupture between the unity that we're supposed to have regardless of generations. We like to think that the church is a certain type of, um, and this is just a slight digression, it's, certain, it's hierarchical and it likes to segregate certain things. But one thing that the church has always promoted was the chants were able to be sung by everybody, regardless of age and regardless of sex. So the liturgical music of the church is supposed to be sung by everybody. Chant is only so strong as the one who sings it. And I don't mean vocally. Chant, like any musical work, masterpiece does not exist unless it is performed. And it's not sufficient that you just make a bunch of CDs and you put it on your library and you leave it in case you take it out and listen to it. It doesn't work like that. Chant is a vehicle for transmitting the spiritual thought of the religious texts and scripture and also the thought of the church and its teachings. And so all musical masterpieces have to be played. I encourage you 
to go online, listen to a few of the recordings, find out where there might be a, a mass location where they have a Gregorian Scola, and go listen to it live. And just think about how you were invited to do this and think about how does it, does it actually aid your prayer? Do you see yourself also, perhaps, in learning this patrimony of the church, which is part of the Catholic identity? Benedict XVI, before his retirement, he had given a certain impetus to restore a lot of this liturgical music, giving new importance to the Vatican choir and asking them to rediscover this type of music. So it's very much uh, an ongoing process. And uh, the United States is one of the leading ca uh, countries and also associations. There's the Catholic Music Association of America, which are strong promoters of renewing liturgical chant and liturgical music. And so there's a lot of resources going on right now here in America. We have about 25 minutes or so for discussion. Uh, if you would, wait for me to bring you the microphone just so we can record your questions. And if we could start with a student first, that would be great. I was so impressed that most of you stopped eating. The last time I had to do something in front of an audience that was eating was at one of my juries for my, my music degree. I think the judges, uh, the professors, they wanted to see how I'd react when they're just chatting away, joking around, and having a drink as I was talking. Um, what would you say is the best way to try to introduce Gregorian chant into like a parish setting that does not have it? And like the reason might be that um, like the people won't want to sing it or they don't know how to do it or like, like along those lines. Okay. So I was a 20 year old guy with my best friend studying music and we got together some of our friends and started a little group and started just singing this stuff to ourselves. And then we went and told Father, hey, Father, can we do this together? Not necessarily in a parish situation, but we just want to do this on our own. And we started doing uh, one of the divine offices. It has to be very natural. You should never impose anything on a parish. That's how you really ruin people's prayer lives and actually offend them. Um, and so you have to be very respectful and not do things artificially. So I would just say get together with a few of your friends, get to know the stuff, and then if you feel confident actually doing it publicly, ask one of your priests, say, do you mind if we do a Friday night Gregorian Mass? You know? And so people who go there, they're already disposed to making a little bit of extra effort to getting to Mass on a Friday night, not just on a Sunday. Um, it's very difficult to start up a Gregorian Mass in a Sunday liturgy when the people have already been used to decades of, that, of the more modern music. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Father, uh, for talking today. Um, I guess the big thing for me is, you know, I, I was I'm only in my 20s. I only grew up with the new mass. Uh, my parents grew up with mostly with the new mass. Uh, and I was, exp I was around when you, uh, uh, the age when you were exposed to the Latin Mass was around the time I was, and I, I fell in love with it. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of Latin Masses in this area. But the only major advantage uh, that the new Mass has over the old Mass is the fact that it was translated into the vernacular. And um, this has been something I've kind of been thinking of is do you, do you think there would be any benefit to translating these texts into English? Because when you look at the Eastern Catholic or the Orthodox or the Assyrian traditions, when a lot of them came to you know, Western Europe or the United States, a lot of them translated it, their own liturgical texts, including the music, into whatever the local language was. And uh, they, they were able to retain their tradition while still making it more accessible to, sure. you know, if you see like a, a Greek in America, they probably don't speak in Greek. And so they made it accessible to people like that and to converts. Uh, and so the whole impetus behind the creation of the Novus Ordo was to, to make it more accessible. Very much so. um, but do you think if 
if we do you think there would be any benefits to sort of introducing a Latin mass but with the same liturgical text with the same chant just translated into English um, do you think there would be anything lost in translation or yeah, it's a very good question I would say that when the Eastern rites coming into the New World, and I call it the New World, the United States, Canada, the Western Hemisphere, um, they made the decision at an early point altogether to do that. Again, don't do anything artificially. I think it's a bit artificial to set this type of music to, um, to the vernacular language, even though it has been done successfully in uh, Chicago. Uh, at, the, at the Mandalayan Seminary, at the Mandalayan Psalter. It's very good music. Uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with it, but that's used in certain uh, religious communities. Also, in a Benedictine Abbey near where I'm from, in Vancouver, a uh, very competent uh, Swiss congregation from Einsilden, and they translated their Gregorian chant into English, at least their psalmody, uh, with a lot of success. However, again, it's a very specific community. They're all able to do this. I think if you were to sing this, I'm just going to do a rough translation. Oh, people of Zion, behold your Lord, the Lord. I think it would be a bit odd. I think uh, it might be a bit stilted and artificial. You're not used to hearing English sung this way. And um, I don't think you'd get as many people interested in it. I think the fact that it is a different sound, a different language, a different, again, cultural matrix brings people into that situation to invite them to discover something else, and if they're interested, they'll continue with it. Okay. Please. There's a lot of hostility to this sort of thing. I mean, I mean among Catholics, I don't mean among atheists. I, I mean, the term Latin mass people I've seen used in a very hostile sense. Do you have any insights into why? Oh. <laughs> um, yes, I have many insights into why. I'm trying to think what is the best thing to say. What's Everybody likes to identify themselves. Everybody likes to say, I'm this and I'm not that, right? And so when people at the time seeing liturgical changes in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, some people were trying to preserve. Other people came on a bit later and identified themselves with this fringe group. You know, uh, I hate to say it, but a lot of people who come to the Latin Mass, they have very extreme positions on a variety of, of things not just on the way you pray and what language and what you, kind of music you have at the liturgy. So it, currently in the situation, it is uh, a certain countercultural movement, you know, within the church and slightly outside the church, depending on the situation. Uh, but for me, I went from seeking to be a professional opera singer with realizing that, in my opinion, that when you have an art where it combines vocal singing, which is the most beautiful instrument, as I'm sure you'd all agree, the human voice is amazing, with an orchestral accompaniment, with the number of musicians participating, including staging and dance and good poetry and dialogue, you can't find a better musical genre, really, or artistic genre, in my opinion, right? And then to go from that practicing that and getting, you know, working for that constantly every year with contracts and all that stuff, and then going to this liturgy on Sunday, where that is supposed to be even be, be more important. You know, the Sunday thing happening, the Sunday call is supposed to be more important than what I was giving to myself, uh, giving myself to during the week. I realized there was a total disjunct. And once I found this music, I was able to say, oh, that's where the connection is now. This is a masterpiece. But it, you, have to, you have to change the way you think when you're going to see this Gregorian chant, right? But to return to your question, uh, why is there so much controversy regarding the Latin mass? It's, a, it's a really complicated, you know. There's, yeah. And I'm trying not to make that part of the, the talk.
Father, could you, uh, you mentioned the importance of uh, the use of vocals. Um, could you say maybe something to why uh, the vocal unaccom unaccompanied and even the organ are prized as the highest form of music mm. in the church? Everybody who loves something wants to sing about it. Everyone wants to write poetry and wants to express their, their sentiments in song. And so you do that also historically in the Old Testament with the Book of Psalms, the Song of Songs. You see this, the canticles being sung in honor of God. And so musical accompaniment of religious practice is common throughout all cultures and civilizations throughout all time. So it's something very innate in man and women to do that. Um, can you just give me your question one more time? I just got, I digressed. It's okay, just tell me again. Well, uh, human voice can convey the text. Human vo uh, instruments cannot convey text, right? That's what Benedict uh, the si uh, 16th, or Cardinal Ratzinger, Joseph Ratzinger, in his reflection on the spirit of the liturgy, he talks about how liturgical music has to be very intellectually centered. It has to be in connection with what's going on with the revealed word of the text, but also pointing towards this spiritual reality, which is the word of God. Uh, the organ, in, I had discovered recently, the organ was an instrument used in the Byzantine court in Constantinople. When the emperor spoke, you played the organ to go along with his proclamations. I didn't know that. And so apparently, other royalty decided to imitate that in even the papal court. So the papal court decided to bring the organ into an accompaniment. So. The organ is considered to be representing uh, the universal aspects of, of instrumental, instrumentalization uh, because it has a variety of sounds. It is a wooden sound, a metallic sound. It has this chordal sound, you know. It tries to imitate all the sounds that uh, nature can produce. So it's seen as a universal instrument. Any other questions? What do you think of women singing Gregorian chant? If they sing it well, it's beautiful. If men sing it well, it's beautiful. I have no problems with it. In 1903, Pius XII had specified that women were not supposed to sing Gregorian chant in the choir. But you have to put the choir in its proper context. The choir was not in the balcony at the back of the church. The choir was in the sanctuary and so even though it was never completely uh, specified as to what he meant, with other papal legislation that came out with Pius XI and Pius XII, women were given permission to sing in liturgical, fulfilling the liturgical music. They just said they should not be in the choir, which meant being in the sanctuary dressed as clerics in the blacks. Yeah. But religious communities have been singing Gregorian chant for over a century now. Very successfully. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, one of the things that you said, which I don't agree with, but I, I, I don't want to challenge you on, I just want to ask you <clears throat> maybe to, to explain it a little bit more, is the notion that other kinds of music other than Gregorian chant can't be liturgical music. Yeah. Um, yeah. As I said, I, I, I cannot accept that as true. However, what I'm interested in is maybe what's the argument, and not against other pieces, kinds of music, but what do you think, you sort of said it, but maybe you could say it again, mm -hmm. on what does Gregorian chant have um, as a musical and a cultural form, but not simply as a cultural form, but as a musical and cultural form that maybe is the highest expression of a, um, a liturgical music instead of the only one. You can say it's the only one, but I suspect you could also explain it by it's the highest expression. So right. if you're going to go by the highest expression, right. what would its characteristics be that, that others could either participate in or not? Yeah. Very good question. And thank you for, uh, in a certain way, you know, just confronting me on that point because you're right, I didn't really explain it well. And it's something that when you're dealing with more of this transcendent aspect of any art, it's hard to, you know, verbalize it. 
Gregorian chant is melody. It is a simple melody. And so it's kind of bared down. You're stripping away other aspects of more developed modern music where you can have rhythmic motifs, you could have harmonic progressions, you could have instrumentalization. So all you're left with is the human voice and a melody. And so in its simplicity, in its development, in the, because things are so pared down is when you do something a bit varied, it becomes much more big. You know, he went up instead of going down. And so even though you might say, well, that's just a, a, a subtle difference, that has carries much more weight. So it's almost like every single note in the Gregorian melody has a certain importance. Because if you take it away, it's not what it was. Whereas, um, if I had a popular hymn, I can rewrite the, the choral progressions, for instance. I could take a three-part hymn and make a four-part. You know, I could really do much more according to the rules of composition with modern music than it can with Gregorian music in a certain way. So um, it lends to a certain amount of precision that you might not have in the same way, if I could use it like that. You know, precision of melody, which you might not have. On that very point, though, and um, I mean, you can go back and you can talk about a, a singularity of melody, if you will, within certain forms of Gregorian chant, but certainly not looking at the chant tradition overall and the simple recognition that a Dominican form of the same text is going to have a different melody than the Roman form, is different from the Ambrosian form. So I, I okay, you made a point, but I don't agree with your point because it's, there is no universality to the melody line necessarily speaking. You're right, you're right. There's no universal, universality to the melody line. Um, and this is where this notion of the, tran the chant being a tradition, being a set form within a set context. The Dominicans have their ancient tradition, the Franciscans, et cetera, the Benedictines. Um, and as you know, the religious do not want to use the Roman books for obvious reasons. They find the Dominican Salve Regina much more beautiful than the Roman. So in that sense, that identity attached to a certain spirituality adds a certain layer to the melody, you could say. No, I'm saying you're right. I'm saying, I'm saying, I'm saying that liturgical music is very much a closed system. You can't take it and it's transplanted all over the place. It's just the fact that the Roman Latin liturgy with the chants said this is the official body of liturgical music to be used up until the Vatican II. Well, yes, because the, Yes, exactly, exactly. Thank you for that clarification. And so you would just argue that you could say that certain hymnody used today in the regular parish setting, that's universal for that closed system in America, in Canada, in France, you know. Father, thank you. Is it, is it better to uh, <laughs> sight read lots of music that I don't know from chant books or to memorize and sing from memory? Does it make a difference if I memorize the chant? <laughs> you pray it much more better. Uh, you pray it, you, you have a greater success of praying it because it's become part of you, you know? Uh, a lot of our men, when they go to the seminary, they don't learn sufficiently how to read chant. So each week we have to practice it and they have to get it in by rote. Uh, how successfully do they participate in that? I don't know, you'd have to ask them. But I would say yes, you should try to memorize it as much as possible. Um, and that adds a certain other layer of participation where you can actually um, not worry, not depend so much on the book, on the text. And that's with, uh, especially say the Requiem Mass, something so heard often. 
you're able to, to pray much more easily. So I would say sight reading, if you're a strong sight reader, go ahead and discover all the different types of music, but generally, yeah, you should try to memorize it. Just same thing with the Psalms, I would say. It's beautiful to, to go through the entire book of Psalms, but at the same time, you do want to get to the point where you are memorizing, so it becomes very much ingrained in you. Dr. Hain? Or, so, pardon me. Yes. So I have, <clears throat> I have laryngitis. I'll do the best I can to, to talk. Um, the, if you want, you use the word universality, but if you wanted to talk about or explain why chant is the purest sort of expression uh, of the liturgy, I mean, it goes I can't give you an exact date, but it goes way back to to the thought that um, uh, musica humana, where this is in sync with singing chant, is in sync with the heavenly spheres or the angelic harmony, harmony of the spheres, however you want to identify it. And um, you know, this is I think it, it was a a medium between um, a way to communicate between that which is known and that which is not known. So it was an inter thought of as being an intermediary and, and as appropriate way then of expressing the liturgy in, in the mass. Uh, but then, you know, th when you look at chant history over many hundreds of years, you know, no, the Notre Dame um, polyphony, which, you know, which of course the, the, the intervals that are used in that polyphony are in accord with what they thought were the perfect intervals again, going back to being in sync with angelic harmony. So um, I think that's the explanation for why chant was seen, you know, from a theological perspective. That perspective is totally lost now. So I think that's why it's hard to make the case that Gregorian chant is the primary or the best way to, to um, express yourself uh, in the liturgy. Thank you for that reflection, it's very good. Um, hello, Father. Thank you for coming today. Uh, can you talk a little bit about um, sort of the notation up there, the, the four lines? Uh, I mean, I'm unfamiliar with that, um, and I mean, I play the trombone. So, so do you ever see <coughs> Gregorian chant in you know sort of uh, what would be familiar with me? You know, your typical five lines, uh, treble clef, treble clef, bass clef, key signatures that we're familiar with, or is it always in in this form? So the five lines in a modern notation is a fixed system. And if you're playing to a specific instrument, you're going to actually uh, target a specific frequency of tone. So your E is always the same for all pieces of music, where this is a, mu a movable system. It's a relative system. They said this is the key of Do. Your, your primary note, at least on the line here, allows you to go up a full step. So you're singing a Re there. And the tone, the actual pitch, the frequency is not specified. So if you had a group of tenors singing, it would be much higher placed. If you have a group of bass singing, it would be much lower pitched. But so, for instance, if this is the do, cl uh, do uh, clef, re, 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 mi, fa, so then you have a half step there, and then descending down, do, si, la, another half step. And so it is um, a variable system according to pitch, but the way it's written is, Visually, all the notes happen within the four lines. And Guido D'Arezzo, when he was coming up with the system, he looked at the, the lines on your hand and said, well, that's our kind of our, our device to, to help us visualize where these pitches are. Um, and so you do have Gregorian chant in modern notation. Uh, they've transitioned it, but it's still a relative system. So, Father, when you encounter people who find joy in the sound of the music and are interested in it, but for lack of a better term, are interested in the, the song without the soul, you know, they, we enjoy it, but could you, could you dial down the Catholic end of it? You know, people who are interested in music less than theology. What do those conversations sound like? What are those, what are those encounters like? This conversation. <laughs> I dialed it down. No, um, you know, uh, chant lovers who 
how would you say, extrapolate the theological aspects, I haven't encountered that so much. So I've done Gregorian chant in non-liturgical situations at a museum, for instance. Uh, they were doing an illuminated manuscript exhibition. They wanted the seminaries to come and just give a quote, a religious sentiment to the mu museum exposition. People listened, they were impressed. They didn't really clap because they sort of knew that, oh, we don't clap at this with this music so much. Um, but we didn't really get into too much conversation. So again, it just, it's very peaceful music. Uh, it's very meditative, uh, but everyone's able to get some aspect from that without being familiar with the theology. I think there was another question. We have time for maybe one more question. And before that, let me just remind you all that we have our regular reception in the great room. Please join us after our discussion to continue the conversation. I think I need to ask this. So as I learned from some Gothic architecture, so back then the literal, uh, the literal rate of population was kind of low. Uh, so they may need that kind of uh, non-linguistic uh, consolation. Mm. Um, but today, I think everything is totally different. Mm. And uh, it's a very individualistic society. And we are encouraged to create our own thought, create our own emotion. And uh, I'm sure some of us still love this. But uh, what would be the good balance between this kind of uh, holy medieval things? I, I, I hope I'm using the right, the right term. And today about our creativity. Mm. Does that make sense? It's an excellent question. It is a catalog science. It's a monument. You can appreciate it from a distance. You can appreciate it from a, a closer point of view. Uh, you know it's always there. You don't always have to go visit it. But if you feel like going to go rediscover it or use it for whatever purpose, you know, it's like I can always go visit this beautiful architectural edifice even though I'm not always there or I'm not so much interested in that architecture per se. Um, in terms of the individualistic uh, ethos, you could say, or the identity going on right now, I think that one thing that people have been doing recently is using these Gregorian themes and composing from them. So taking one aspect, not just the melodical progressions, but perhaps taking the modal set setting and taking that and writing music on that. So that's a way of uh, using it for their own purposes of uh, personal creativity, okay? And that was in always encouraged by the church. You know, Pius X said in 1903 that liturgical music should always use the Gregorian chant as its blueprint, but then compose all the other music to go with it. Sorry I didn't say that during the talk. Quick, we have a quick follow-up. Yes. I'd, I'd also like to add to what you say is that uh, one of the biggest differences, I think, is your toolbox of you know, the, the, the basis of, of being creative was, was seen as coming from God and not coming from within. And that's, what I think, one of the biggest differences in, so. in the way that we look at creativity today. It was a very different outlook, even into the 18th century. Even just the notion of Gregorian chant, they like to attribute it to St. Gregory the Great of the 6th century, but most historians say that was not the case. I mean, these melodies developed perhaps at the time, but they really developed more in a systematic way uh, since the 10th century and onwards. Thank you, Father Garrick, for your time with us. Let's thank our guests.